this. So give me one second. Perfect. Okay. Um, welcome everyone to um, our three day session of just um, a nice payroll overview. Um, I had to take a walk down memory lane and I see that um, Carol is on this morning and it made me chuckle, you know, thinking of, you know, years ago when everybody would travel all the way to Northwest Ohio for a week of some pretty intense training, um, you know, eight o'clock till five o'clock, you know, for five straight days. And the thought of that now, I just like, oh my goodness, how did we all survive, right? Um, so, you know, fortunately with technology and um, some, you know, thinking of how we can continue to improve the process of our train the trainer, so to speak, um, process, we are now splitting this down into three smaller days of training. And I know for those of you that have been on um, trainings with us, you know, in the past month or so, we've talked about, you know, our um, thinking and, you know, we're going to take payroll super basic. Um, we're going to take, you know, break it down into three days. And this morning, um, you know, we're going to talk about uh, sort of the pre payroll process steps. And then tomorrow, Andrea is going to cover the actual payroll process. And then on day three, um, fortunately for Fortunately, uh, you guys get to hear me again, um, talk about all the, the post payroll stuff. Um, so everything you're, you know, most um, users are gonna process, you know, after they take that sigh of relief and the, the um, ACH files at the bank um, and those follow-up kind of steps. So hopefully you can see the agenda that I have um, um, on, the on the screen. And, um, you know, that's how we're gonna break up the next three days. Um, I did want to show you um, on our wiki page, I know that you probably all, you know, are aware of where our training um, information is, um, but I want to step you through um, where you're going to find the information that we're going to talk about um, in the upcoming days. So from our SSD team meetings and trainings page, um, you know, this is the, the main page where I'm sure you guys are all familiar with, you know, where you can register where you can view our upcoming trainings. Um, going forward, after our um, sessions are complete, this training materials section is gonna be updated. So right now it's not um, updated because um, you know, we do have the USAS side and then inventory coming up in the next couple of weeks. So once you know, those have all been concluded, we're gonna revamp this area here. But for now, if you click on the left-hand side of the page um, under the child pages, if you go to this ITC overview training materials, this is the new and improved um, look of our overview sessions. So um, we have it split up into columns. So we're gonna talk about the USAS side, obviously. Um, and then in the upcoming weeks, it's gonna be the USAS side and then inventory. And then in the upper section here, we have you know, the agenda, which if you click on, um, that's gonna take you to what I just showed you. Um, the, the supporting um, PowerPoint, the user manual, the appendix. And then after each day's session is complete, we will, re we will link those recordings then here. So after day one, after day two, after day three. So you can just go right to those recordings um, you know, and, and revisit those or listen to those for the first time. And then if you scroll down, we've broken each of those days um, into sections. So um, we're going to link then parts of the video to um, those specific areas. So if you or a user is just wanting to talk about, you know, see about, you know, pre-balancing your, your payroll. Um, we'll link then the, the part of the video that applies to that specific section, okay? And the same is gonna be throughout, you know, this entire page the, the for the USAS side and the inventory side. Okay, so we hope that this is going to be less 
um, I don't want to say intense, but overwhelming, I guess might be a better word. Um, and we're going to break it down and we're just going to go through specific processes. So you're not going to see us go through each item, um, you know, under the menu option. We're going to step through the process. And in the, in the process of talking about that, we'll go through each of those uh, menu options that apply to that specific um, process. Okay, we're not going to go through the PowerPoint, um, you know, and step through that side by slide. That's sort of used as a supplement um, to our training. So we sort of feel like, you know, the hands on approach is the best. Um, so that's, you know, the direction we're going to take um, throughout these overview sessions. So we welcome any feedback. Obviously, you're going to get, um, you know, uh, an evaluation after the training. Please feel free to, you know, be very honest. Um, let us know how we can improve, change, because, um, you know, as you, you know, if you attended last year, you can see that it's changed um, this year and we'll continue to improve upon that um, to make it as best as possible for, for all of you, okay? All right, so again, we're gonna take the train the trainer approach, um, get down to some very, very payroll basic um, basics. And the first thing that you'll see is um, we've revamped the um, payroll checklist. So again, in our documentation, um, you guys all know how to get to the, the manual. Um, if you go to the appendix under the checklist option, there is the USPS um, payroll processing checklist. This has been completely revamped. So, um, you know, as you guys have all probably witnessed with migrating your districts, you know, every district does their payroll process so differently. And who knew there were, you know, 50 different ways to get from point A to point Z, but, um, you know, all the steps need to be taken, but everybody gets to that point differently. So this is a very basic checklist um, that sort of steps you through all the steps that you know will need to be taken, but how they get to those steps could vary. So that's why we've put you know at the top um, just a reminder because we know that you at the ITC level have you know your own customized checklist for your um, own districts, as well as then each district might have their own customized checklist. So you know we do make a disclaimer at the top to, you know, if, if districts are um, using this to please check with you first um, to make sure that, you know, there aren't any steps on this checklist that, that you might have customized to meet your district's needs. Okay, so we're going to step through um, the pre, as I mentioned, the pre-steps um, today. Um, and you might note that, you know, we've allotted an hour and a half for each day. We don't know if we're gonna use an hour and a half. So we're gonna just get through um, the steps that we have you know, assigned to each day. And then you know, we might have to adjust our time going forward um, to have a, once we have a better, clearer picture on how long each day is gonna take. But we are hoping to keep it a, an hour and a half or less. Um, we know your time is, is valuable. So today we're gonna step through steps one through seven. So just basically getting started. So, you know, I try to encourage districts to, you know, do it as much ahead of time as you can. All of that, you know, pre-balancing and entering all those exceptions before you even hit the initialize new payroll button is super ben beneficial. Um, so basically when you, you know, the goal I feel is when you hit that initialize new payroll and you enter your dates, it's basically checking, double checking your figures and then, you know, balancing, checking those changes on the payroll report, and then you're moving forward. So you're clicking, you know, those next series of buttons and that part is done. So it's all of the things that we're going to talk about this morning that I think are super beneficial to get done you know, as soon as possible. Um, and I know that, you know, that's not always the real world, but, um, you know, as much as you can do ahead of time, 
and balance all of that is um, is only going to make the process easier. So the first step um, is to actually, you know, go and um, sync those accounts. Now, this step is only necessary if um, you've come into work or if the district has come into work and now, you know, USAS has added those payroll accounts and payroll needs to use them. So again, remember this, this synchronization process happens automatically every night. So if you know you you're coming in in the morning and you're ready to start payroll and there's no new pay accounts that that um, are going to be used or needed on the payroll side, then this first step can be totally um, you know checked off the list and you can move on. The one thing I wanted to to show you and just as a reminder. Um, just keep in mind and really emphasize to your districts because it is a little confusing, um, but I think that, you know, once they're aware of how the process works, um, when they hit that account synchronization, it's going to say that the, the synchronization is completed. If they need to re, you know, update those, refresh those pay accounts, they have to click on the, the option, sync accounts with USAS. That starts the process. Now, just because it's submitted to USAS doesn't mean it's done. You wanna wait th through the process or the district wants to wait through the process until this again says the account synchronization is complete. So sometimes I think you know districts get a little impatient or they're not understanding. And they think, oh, the, the accounts are, you know, like I clicked on the button, you know, what's, why am I not able to, to see that account on the payroll side? Let it, let it complete the process. So you can see here, um, you know, it's completed three of five. Those are blocks. So it's not three of five accounts. Um, I don't recall how many accounts are in each block. Um, but again, it's going through and it's, it's doing its thing, so to speak. And then once you get the message that says account synchronization completed, all the accounts have been updated and synced. So now we can continue then on to oops, step, oh my goodness, step two. So step two is just, just do a quick glance of your posting period. Um, so is it, you know, is the right month current? Um, and that is in the upper right hand corner in the, the ribbon. So this, you can see, um, our test files are a little outdated. Um, but, you know, as of today, you would probably, you know, see March, 2023, and then it also provides you with the fiscal year. So the nice thing about redesign and posting periods um, to, to see those, I'm going to go to core and I'm going to go to posting period. The nice thing about redesign, which you weren't able to um, have the flexibility in classic is because of the posting periods. Now you can sort of work ahead, so to speak. So you, if you remember back to classic, you had to completely have, um, you know, everything closed and that involved a whole series of steps. Um, and then those dates then on USP Con controlled what the district could and couldn't do. So now that's moved over to posting periods. And there are actually three different um, ways you can look at a posting period. It can be opened, it can be closed, and or it can be current. Okay. So in order to post a payroll within the month, that month has to be current. So if I was to post um, you know, a pay date, a payroll with a pay date of September, I'm going to get an error because my current posting period is August. You can see the current posting period is highlighted in green. I like to use these, the grid, the columns on the grid. Um, that helps me see things versus the icons to the left. 
but it's really, you know, your personal preference. Um, if you hover over each of those icons, it does give you a tool tip, um, you know, and it allows you to then click and close or click and open, um, click and make something current. Okay, but if you look at these, the columns, you know, open and current, it does give you the information there as well. It also gives you um, the ability to see when a posting period was created or open, I'm sorry, and then when it was closed. This can be super helpful, um, you know, when you're trying to troubleshoot um, issues, you know, at the district level. So those dates and times can come into, can be useful. Okay, so again, you can only have one um, posting period um, current. You can have multiple um, periods open and closed. So going back to, you know, redesign versus classic, you know, what this flexibility allows you is if you're not truly done with like balancing, reconciling, you know, that month, you can keep that month open and then you can move on to the next month, create that posting period. You can then make it current. Um, and then you can move on with the, your processing. So you can even just leave that month open that you've created, initialize your payroll. But until when you go to post that payroll, that month, um, based on the pay date, has to be your current month. Okay. Another thing that I can't, you know, drill home hard enough is once a district is done with the month, they've done, they're done reconciling, they're done, you know, balancing, making any adjustments, um, make sure that they're closing their months on a timely manner. And I know, you know, we've had some tickets come in recently um, with issues of, you know, districts not closing month, um, closing their months for back to you know a year um keep in mind that when you close a month that triggers that month's report bundle and copies that to the file archive so you can see if you close multiple months you know way after the fact even that's going to create those report bundles with all the same information as of the current time period and copy those out to the file archive. Now, it might not sound like such a horrible idea now, but it does cause issues when auditors come, you know, that's the, those are the reports they're looking at. Um, if you, if districts need to go back and look at those as of, you know, how information was as of a specific time, it's not going to be accurate. So I can't emphasize enough when you, you know, any checklist you have, any, you know, time that you have when you're talking about posting periods, closing, you know, closing a month, a quarter, you know, emphasize to your districts the importance of closing those. Okay. And it's not that you guys probably aren't aware of it. It's just, you know, getting the users to actually click on that button to close it, um, but just try to stress the importance to them. Okay, um, if you guys have any questions, I know I didn't mention this at the start, um, please interrupt me at any time and um, you don't have to wait till I ask if there are any questions or um, please interrupt me. I, it's not a problem at all. Or you can post them in the chat. I'll try to be good about um, looking at that. Okay, step three. Um, so step three is just um, entering any changes that, that might be pertinent to you know, the payroll that the district is working on. This could be adding a new employee. This could be changing um, direct deposit information. This could be changing pay accounts. This could be um, changing, updating um, payroll items and so forth. So. Um, you know, those are all just making simple changes like that are probably pretty self-explanatory. Um, I did want to go through and, and talk this morning about adding a new employee because there's really 
um, several ways to do that. Um, so you can add an employee using the employee onboarding. So, um, you know, that's a whole nother module and we're not going to talk about that this morning. Um, we're going to save that and, you know, break that out into a, a session all on its own. Um, so that will be coming. Um, so if you are interested in, you know, the whole on onboarding process, we'll, we'll cover that in detail on a, on a, a separate session. Um, so you can go, you know, uh, down the core options and you can add an employee, um, you know, that way. Um, probably the more uh, efficient and, a, you know, time-saving way is to um, either use a, a file to load your um, new employee. Um, we have all kinds of templates um, out in the, um, the report repository. Um, hopefully you're all aware of where that is. And if you're not, I can show you here. So if you, under help, if you go to the public shared reports library, this is where all of the report um, definitions um, are, are housed. So um, you can go out here and take a look at um, all the various, you know, JSON files, those report definitions, um, and these have been the sort of the, like most commonly requested reports. Um, so rather than reinventing the wheel, um, you know, each district or each ITC, um, they're housed out here and we've broken them down by, you know, maybe those reports you might use um, on a per pay basis. Maybe those that you might use on a monthly, a quarterly, fiscal year, calendar year, um, EMIS related, miscellaneous, and then down at the bottom are the new hire employee template um, uh, report definitions. So again, you, you know, it, if you have a district that wants to load information using um, in a template, um, a report definition, instead of entering all the information, you know, by hand, um, in the various core options, these templates then can be helped, can help um, the district to do that. So they're out here for anybody to use. You can click on the actual template itself. You'll click download, and then you'll go to the report manager then and import um, that report definition. And I'm sure you're, you guys are all aware of, you know, how that process works. Okay. So we're gonna go and um, just like classic, remember that the very first um, record that needs to be entered for an employee to establish them in the system is the employee record, okay? So like the bio screen in classic, it's the employee record is what establishes them in the system. Um, one thing that I, I do wanna point out, um, that when, when districts are entering a brand new employee, I, I think it's a good habit to get into, um, you know, double check and make sure they're not already in the system. So, you know, if you click that include archive option, you know, really make sure that they're not, you know, entered, verify their social security number isn't already in the system. You know, there is the rule to prevent duplicate social security numbers from being entered. But, you know, I don't think it hurts to just start here, check that include archive option and just double check and make sure that they're not duplicating any, you know, or creating any unnecessary work for themselves. Okay. So um, in order to, you know, add um, a record using mass load, and that's what we'll use, there are you know, specific information that has to be included in your load file. If you use the templates that we talked about in the report repository, that's a start. So it's going to give you, um, you know, uh, the headings um, that are required and those that you, you know, also may want to include um, just because it's relevant information that needs to be added, not necessarily required. Um, those templates are going to have that information included already. 
So the thing to keep in mind about mass load, and I'm sure you're all perfectly aware of it, but I just want to point it out, anything that's bolded is required. So in this employee file, in order to use mass load and load an employee record, we have to have the number, the last name, the first name, and then off to the right-hand side, anything that's not bolded, you know, you can include in your load file, um, but it's not required, okay? These column headings have to be exactly as they're listed in the documentation. I, a lot of times, will even open this up, and I'll copy and paste these right into my spreadsheet so that I don't miss you know, a dot, a period, or capitalizing something that should be, or, you know, capitalizing something that shouldn't be, put a space somewhere that shouldn't be, and so forth. So I'll a lot of times just copy and paste these right into my um, file that I'm going to load, and that makes life so much easier. Okay? So again, keep in mind that, you know, these are the required fields. They have the re the um, column headings are what drive the file to be successfully loaded. They can be in any order in the file, so it doesn't matter if number is the last column, the first column, that part doesn't matter um, when you're using mass load. Okay, so I already have a file set up, um, and I can actually show you that. So I have um, a file here that's set up with all the information that um, I want to load in my um, for my new employee. So once I have my load file created, I'm going to save this as CSV. So I'm going to do a save as, save it as CSV. And now I'm good, good to go and, and load the file. So I'm going to go back to my instance here. And I'm going to go to utilities. And I'm going to go to mass load. So once I have my file in place, I've saved that as CSV in CSV format. I'm going to simply choose that file. and I've called this test employee. And then I have to select what, basically what record, what area, um, what option am I loading this file into? So this is an employee record. So I'm gonna select employee. I'm gonna click load. Once that record then is loaded, you can see that it shows here, records loaded one, error zero. If it did contain an error, and we'll see that later this morning, then I would open up that error file and that's gonna tell me what the system didn't like about my CSV file. I can then correct that, make those corrections to the CSV file, not to the error file. And then I'm going to save that again as CSV and load it, you know, continue to load it until it's successfully um, loaded into the system. All right, so I named this employee <laughs> I thought I named it Easter Bunny. Let's see here. Okay, let me open my file one more time. So test, let's try it that way once. I am not sure what I did wrong. Of course, you know, you test this umpteen times before your session and it works just fine. And it said it loaded. What am I missing?
Let me look. Oops. Try this. Okay, I must have had archived <laughs> set to true in my load file, and that is not what I wanted intended for that to, to do. So I apologize. We're going to unarchive that employee so we can work with it. Okay, sorry for that little snafu. So we have, obviously, now that we went through all that, we have our new employee um, added. So this record, again, establishes the... Um, the employee in the system, um, you know, you districts can go through then and complete, you know, any inf other information that they did not include in the load file, um, or, you know, obviously they want to verify and check that and make sure that everything looks good. Um, <clears throat> I did want to point out that um, something that's kind of unique on the employee record that, um, districts may or not may or may not be aware of are these these fields that are in the standard payroll standard personnel um you know in classic we um didn't have as much customization um ability um as we do in the redesign and i know a lot of districts were using on bioscreen um the second screen of bioscreen i think yeah the second screen um those, you know, these um, user defined fields for various um, reporting purposes, like maybe if a, the district was using Benelogic to report um, insurance information to, um, they were using um, those custom, those user defined fields to report that information. Well, payroll money one, payroll code three, you know, that doesn't mean much to a user. They just knew that I have to put this information in this field. Well, um, in the redesign, you can customize these um, descriptions to make them more meaningful. So um, you can see here, I've actually went in and I've changed one to be check distribution. Um, so I'm going to show you quick, you know, how a district might want to do that. Um, and if you go to system, custom field definition, um, those are all on the employee record. So if you go down to like payroll code one, payroll code two, you know, maybe they're using this payroll code one field to report what, you know, insurance group the, the employee is in. So I can change that display name to be something more meaningful. And I can go back then and see on our Easter Bunny employee that if I go to their employee screen and I go down to um, the standard payroll, you can see now that that display name has been changed. So that might mean something you know, to the to the user versus just knowing I have to put in the insurance group in that specific field. Okay, so just to point out that, you know, those, those are customizable, you know, make them work for, um, you know, have the user make those work for, for them, um, because that's not something that they could have done um, before. Okay. All right. So um, again, this is the first then um, screen that needs to be added um, to enter our new employee. So once that employee record is added, um, you know, a nice way to just kind of, you know, make sure that everything is entered that needs to be is just, you know, go use that employee's dashboard now. So I'm going to search for Bunny and I'm going to go to this employee's um, dashboard. And I can see that I can just keep going right down the line if I don't choose to load the information. And I can know then that, yep, I, you know, I'm going to go to positions next, enter that information, compensations, and so forth. So <clears throat> the next, excuse me, the next record then is positions. I'm going to click on create. 
and I can go ahead and I can begin entering then all the information for this employee's position. So remember job screen is broken down into two parts now. So we have the position screen. So the first screen of job screen um, with all of the description sort of information. And then we have the second part, um, which is the second screen of job screen, which is the um, compensation. And we'll talk about that next. So those two parts now make up the what was job screen in classic. So keep in mind, um, you know, those two parts make up the whole. Along with that is the um, idea of EMIS reporting. So again, in order for everything to be reported correctly, the district is going to want those reportable to EMIS flags checked on the position record as well as the compensation record so that those two, two parts are reported accurately. Okay. Now, the nice thing also about the redesign is the use of templates. So up here in the right-hand corner on most screens, you're going to see the ability to either create a template or and then save that, or we can choose from an existing template and have that information populate um, automatically for us. And then we might need to fill in a few other things or change something that might not apply to this specific employee, but it's a huge time saver. So encourage your districts to use templates. Um, you can also create multiple templates. So maybe in the positions case, you would want to create a template for your certified employees that are regular, your classified employees that are your regular employees. Maybe you also want to create a, a certified substitute um, template, a classified sub substitute template. So again, you can create multiple templates, name them, you know, something that's going to be easily identified. And then instead of, you know, entering all the information in every single field, those values that are most common with that group of people, then just choose the template and all of that information is going to be populated for you. Okay. And then again, there's probably going to be some information that you'll have to tweak or, you know, enter or update or change, but it does, you know, provide you for a basis to like, you know, start and not have to enter tab, enter tab through every single field. All right. So again, encourage your districts to use these templates. Um, if you've created, if they've created one in error, you know, you can use the X um, once that template is selected to get rid of it. Um, and then you can start over. Okay. The unfortunate part is when you use templates, you have to create the record and then go in and, and either create the template or pick the template for the employee that you're, you're working with. So I know that that part of it is a little um, not as user friendly as, as we'd like it. So there is a jury issue um, to actually sort of make those templates, you know, be um, something on its own or make it easier to, you know, just add the template without having to create a record that doesn't already exist, go into that record and select the template or create a template. Okay. But yeah, these are super helpful. Um, again, the ability to create multiple, um, you know, and then be able to select that based on what category of, of employee you're adding is, is a huge time saver. Okay. So I'm just going to click save here. I'm going to close out of this. So we now have our um, position added. So now we're going to move on to the compensation. Um, again, if it's not a, a record that's being loaded, then you'll go to the record and click create. And now it's asking, you know, what position do I want to um, create this compensation for? And then it'll ask you for the type. So is it a contract or a non-contract? Um, I'm going to select contract and I'm going to click continue. Most of you by now know the difference between a contract and a non-contract. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the difference. Um, 
just keep in mind that you know the screens are going to look significantly different. Um, if it's a regularly paid employee that's pointing to you know that has a set obligation, they're pointing to a job calendar with you know with work days on it, then that probably should be um, a contracted type of position. So when you have the contracted type of position, there's certain key um, fields that are required. So the code being one of them, remember um, this is just um, a way for the system to identify um, which compensation basically you're talking about or you're applying um, those, those records to. Um, so for instance, um, if I'm using attendance, if I'm doing um, uh, any kind of mass change or mass load, um, if I have multiple compensations, the system needs to know what record to apply those changes to. This code field uniquely identifies this specific compensation, okay? So we can't reuse a code year after year. Um, we, we're going to have to change it. So it has to be unique to each compensation. Um, <clears throat> I lost my train of thought. I was going to say something else about that. Now I forget. Okay, it'll come back to me. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> so again, this is going to um, uniquely identify this specific compensation. Um, let's see here. The label field. Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, this it can be super helpful with, um, you know, now that we don't override um, compensations like Classic did when you, um, you know, purged a new contract, it overwrote um, the existing job screen. And we all know that that's no longer the case anymore. It just creates a new compensation. So you can see over years, um, you know, if a district, if a, uh, an employee has been with the district for 20 years, they could have 20 or more compensations. So the beautiful thing about the redesign is if you have to verify employment, um, do any kind of like, you know, uh, workman's comp information reporting, um, you know, with just a couple of clicks, you're able to see then all of those, that compensation information in one spot. You don't have to go to an archived, you know, account or file and look up year by year. It's all right in front of you. So an easy way for you to see on the screen then and differentiate between all of those, those each year's compensation is to use the label field. So, you know, it's user defined. So it, you know, doesn't have to be a set, you know, label or, um, you know, they don't have to be, um, you know, in place a certain way, each district might want to um, use their labels in a different, you know, different uh, naming convention. That's the word I was looking for. Um, but they probably do want to be consistent. So maybe they want to enter something like FY23. That tells me that this compensation is for fiscal year 23. Others I've seen, you know, they actually put the year, maybe 22-23, um, others 22-2023, 20, whatever is going to make most sense to them. But again, they do want to make, you know, be consistent and um, whatever is going to be most helpful. So then again, use those label, those label fields then to identify this is this year's compensation. So when you're looking at the compensation grid for this employee, you can look down a list and know right away, um, you know, once that label column has been added to your grid, that this is the compensation that, that I need to, I want to look at. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so we're just going to go through here and select those required fields. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a little frog in my throat. Um, when, it when we're talking about contracted compensations, keep in mind the start and the stop dates are super important. So this is going to, um, based on the dates that we enter here, 
it's going to go out to this calendar and then count the number of work days it finds between, between the set of dates. So if I, you know, if this is my a teacher's calendar and I know that the teacher should have 183 work days, then when I put in those dates, I should see 183 work days entered here. Okay, this is gonna automatically be calcu or, um, calculated for me. Now, <laughs> one thing to keep in mind with these dates is this date here, you this Rick's will want this to be the first work day that um, is on the calendar. So your teachers, you know, maybe they start August 15th. Um, that's the, what the start date should be, the first work day of the, the contract. The stop date, um, while it sounds logical to, to use, like their last work day is maybe sometime in May, May 25th. Um, that is not actually the stop date that you want entered um, in this field. You A good rule of thumb is the stop date needs to be one day less than next year's compensation start date. So if you know next year's teachers are going to start, their first workday is now on August 14th, we're going to use the compensation stop date as August 13th. So this year's is the 13th, next year's then is going to, the start date is going to be the 14th. So they should just run consecutive. So not only are these dates important for the contract work days to count those, it's also used for the duration the district is going to pay this employee. So if you remember back to classic, you know, try not to do that so often, but, you know, there was that magic time that you had to purge those new contracts. You couldn't do it too soon, you couldn't do it too late, or that would not work well um, with the way the system worked. Now, you know, if a district knows their, you know, work calendar, their school calendar has been approved for next year, and they know their, you know, negotiated agreement's been approved, um, they can actually go in and create um, new contracts, you know, a couple years out. Because everything is date driven, those contracts are not going to be paid on those compensations until the start and the end dates fall until the start date falls within that pay period. Okay, and obviously the stop date can't be outside of, you know, before that either. So once, you know, summer starts to hit, you know, don't, districts don't have to wait to build their new contracts and actually activate them. They can do that at any time. And the system is smart enough to know, even if there's, you know, pays remaining on the old contract, that is, it's going to pay off that 26th or 24th pay, and it will start counting then the work days on that new contract, but not pay them until the old is paid off. We'll get into a lot more detail um, in the new contract session with start and stop dates you know, timing of, of new contracts and so forth. But these start and stop dates are so important and I can't stress that enough um, for those couple reasons, okay? All right. Let's put something down here. Oops. All right, and we're gonna just put something in here. And I think we should be good to go just for our, um, let's put something here. All right. So we're gonna save this. And it's telling you now that um, certain information has been, oops, I know what I didn't do. I'm gonna click the stretch paid um, option. So I do want this to be stretch paid. So there's a paper period. So I'm going to hit calculate. Um, and yes, unfortunately, you do have to hit save um, before the calculate option appears. Um, I do think we have a, an issue to sort of 
um, look at that a little differently. But right now, um, you do have to hit save. And then if you edit and go back, you have the uh, ability to um, hit the calculate button. So it, the system is telling you that the paper period has been calculated. And because the unit amount, what did I not do? Oh, I didn't put dates in. Oh, my goodness. Um, and I honestly don't know if this job calendar has days on it. So um, it might not work the best. I also do encourage districts <clears throat> or, you know, encourage districts to use the calendar. Um, we have seen of late a couple um, instances where um, dates were entered that years were entered that are not um, accurate. So if if you just, you know, simply click the um, uh, calendar option and then select the date from the calendar, that kind of eliminates the, the chances of entering, um, you know, the wrong value in, in the, the year, like 0023 or 02003 or something silly like that. So that will eliminate um, the ability to um, enter something that shouldn't. Okay, so now we've entered some information and that's as good as we're gonna get our example today um, for um, Bugs Bunny, or the Easter Bunny, sorry. Um, you can see there's some really cool options that I wanted to point out um, that appear on um, when you're just in the view mode. Um, on most of these core options. Um, one is the audit report. So this is a single audit report, single object audit report. So we're just gonna have the ability to run an audit report for a certain date range for just this employee, for just this compensation. So, you know, super helpful if you're um, needing to, you know, track down um, troubleshoot some kind of um, problem that you're having with a district, you know, enter your start and your stop date and then generate that single object audit report. Wonderful, wonderful tool. Also, um, we've added recently the ability to print various screens. So districts wanted a way to be able to verify information um, and not, you know, just look at it on a screen or maybe take a screenshot of that and put it in some kind of personnel folder. Um, so the print screen option gives you the ability um, to do that. So if you're a, a, a paper person like I am, I like to you know print my reports and verify my app that way and not just look at a screen. Um, this is uh, a wonderful tool to be able to do that. We also now um, have the ability, and this was just added recently, um, to generate a salary notice. So wonderful, wonderful tool. Um, this is just a salary notice for this particular um, <clears throat> individual and for this compensation. So if I click that, um, I have, you know, the ability to give it a file name, um, a date that I want printed on the actual notice. Um, it's just going to print one. So the sort option probably doesn't uh, <clears throat> mean much here. The school year I want to print it on the form. I can also include the district information. So all of their, you know, the, the address information, the, the name of the school district. And then you do have the ability to, just like direct deposits, you have the ability to um, create a customized salary notice. Um, we've had a lot of questions about wanting various um, fields added to the salary notice that aren't available. Um, coming very soon is the ability to add like unit amount, um, salary schedule information. Um, so look for that um, real shortly. Um, and we will continue to improve upon adding, you know, various other information to make that even more customizable than it is now. Um, so just like you do with direct deposit um, customization, you would save that form, you would import it in the report manager um, using the create um, form option. And then once that's imported, you would see that um, then um, listed here uh, and the ability for you to select that. And then you can click generate salary notice. 
we can do this real quick here just so you can see it. Um, and you can see here then is what that very basic, um, you know, for our purposes, I didn't even enter everything into the compensation, but it does look like it has everything. So that's good. Um, you do have, <clears throat> excuse me, you do have the ability to email the salary notice as well. Um, so that can be um, set up and then um, emailed to the employee. Again, we're going to touch upon salary notices when we go through new contract and that whole process. So I'm not going to go into great detail um, today as far as how to get that set up and customizing and all that kind of stuff. But I did want to make you aware that it, you know it's out there and it's available. Okay, wonderful, wonderful additions to um, the various. Um, core options. Okay, leaves. Um, so this is like Ben screen in classic. Um, so this is where you are um, have the ability to create um, and tell the system what benefits is this employee um, eligible for. Uh, so you can you know enter their accumulate per month option. Um, you can set the leave um, unit. So is this employee to be accumulating leave on a daily or an hourly basis? And then you also wanna make sure that you set a maximum. So in order for the employee's balance and the accumulation per month to happen correctly, you always wanna make sure that this maximum leave amount is entered, okay? So um, <clears throat> make sure you enter something here. Probably the reset value applies to just personal leave. So usually, you know, you, that personal leave gets reset and not accrued like sick leave and vacation. So um, here's, you know, um, under personal leave, you'd probably probably be entering something in that reset value. Um, all right, I think that's all that we need to talk about here. So that's leaves. Pay distributions. Um, this is their direct deposit set up. So is this employee to be receiving a physical check or are they going to be set up as a direct deposit employee? So this, this pay distribution is what tells the system whether to create a physical check or whether to create a direct deposit. If it's a direct deposit, then you know where should those funds be deposited to. So this type here controls whether they're going to be receiving a physical check or a direct deposit. And then if you, you know, select the direct deposit type, here's where you're going to enter all the various, you know, direct deposit information for this specific employee. Again, they can have multiple pay distributions. Um, you know, maybe they want a, a fixed amount going to um, a specific account, um, keep in mind, just like Classic, they'll have to have another account um, set up as percent 100. So any remaining, even if there isn't an, isn't any remain to, you know, fall into that other account, um, the, the system always has to have that percentage 100 account existing. Okay. All right, we're just gonna, I don't even know if we need this for what we're doing. Okay, so we have the, excuse me, leave um, screen set up, paid, paid distributions. We're gonna skip payments, obviously. I'm gonna skip attendance for right now. Um, we're going to go down to payroll items. And again, um, payroll items is another um, area where when you click the create option and then you go in and you select that specific payroll item, the use of templates is so helpful. So you can set up those templates then, you know, to always have the rate type 
set to tax tables, which is probably, you know, the majority of your employees. Um, and then, you know, maybe down here, you would also want the use new W-4 box checked, and then that might be it. Um, but you can set up those templates then um, for each and every um, payroll item. So your city tax um, payroll items, super helpful. So you don't have to look up the rate each time or remember the rate. Um, those, those values will automatically be populated for you when you use, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the template that's been created. Okay. Again, you know, if you need to update it, um, click the X and start over. Um, or if you want to add and create multiple, you have the ability to do so. Okay, so you're going to go down then and you're going to create all of those payroll items that apply to this employee, federal, state, any city, um, the retirement, um, you know, any annuities, you know, insurances, any benefits they might have, um, Medicare, o OSDI tax, if that applies, and so forth. And you're probably all familiar with, you know, adding all of those. <clears throat> and then next is the pay accounts. So um, keep in mind that, like we mentioned before, in order for um, a pay account to be used on the payroll side, <clears throat> excuse me, I have to take a sip. Of... Sorry about that. Um, in order for that pay account to be used on the payroll side, it has to exist on the USAS side. And then we want those accounts to be synced so that the two talk to each other and it's recognized on the payroll side and picked up and, and we're good to go. We can no longer add pay accounts on the payroll side. It all has to start with the USAS side. So that's different than classic was. So to add um, a pay account, I'm gonna click add. And I'm going to start entering then um, any, oops, any part of the account that I might know. So if I know the full account code, I can keep typing. And then once you know it narrows that selection down, I can go ahead and I can then choose that pay account that's appropriate for this position. I can also add multiple pay accounts. So if the district would like this particular position to be charged X number of dollars um, to maybe a grant account, and then any remaining amount to be charged to a general fund account, um, I can do so. So I can keep clicking the add option multiple times. Just keep in mind that if you're using percentages, they always have to equal 100% as a, as a whole. If you're using a fixed dollar amount account, you always have to have that percentage 100 account um, added as well so that any remaining amount can be charged to that percentage account, okay? If there's a maximum in effect, um, the system has the ability to track that maximum amount. Um, and then once that maximum is reached, that account will no longer be charged and then it will charge then the, the next percentage <clears throat> account on file. Um, the start and stop dates, um, you're probably all familiar with those. If you want to control when this account begins to be charged, um, you can enter or control that with um, the dates. You know, if it's something you're just wanting to charge, starting to charge um, the next payroll, then we want to leave the blank, the dates blank. And then you have your employer distribution and leave projection flags already checked for you. So, you know, if those don't apply then you do wanna uncheck those. So I'm just gonna click save here. Okay, so that is, you know, quickly adding um, all the various components then to this new employee manually. Again, you can use the templates that we have out in, um, you know, the, the report repository. Um, if you're, if you would rather load you know, maybe you have, you know, 
50 new employees at the start of a school year, you know, districts might want to consider using those um, templates that we have and loading those that information. So it's going to that's it'll be a huge time saver. Okay. All right. Are there any questions when it comes to um, adding a new employee? I did want to point out a couple um, options that are newer under the core option. Um, and I'm sure you've all seen them. It's just, I like the, the view and the look of them is so much, um, it's, it's wonderful. Um, so those three options are the new view um, in leaves, pay distribution, and a payroll accounts. So um, under leaves, the nice thing about this new leaves option is you do actually have the ability to um, enter uh, a balance. So if this is a district that is, I'm sorry, a user that is an employee that's carrying a, a leave balance from another um, employer, you have the ability then to enter that balance right here. So say they're carrying forward you know, X number of days, um, what's 15 days um, on their balance, I can actually just enter that balance right on this new leave screen um, and not have to enter the accumulation separately. And I'm gonna put five here and I'm gonna click save. So you can see then, if I go back to, oh, and I do have to enter the information for the other um, leave that the employee is eligible for. So I'm gonna give them also three personal days. And then they're also eligible for vacation. Um, Let's just do, I'm just going to put in some days here. I'm not going to reset that. I'm a daily. Okay. Now we're going to save it. So I entered all the information for all the various leave um, types this employee was eligible for. Now, if I go back to the dash, this employee's dashboard, type bunny, right? You can see here that I gave them a balance of 15 sick days and three personal days, and it's it's already available for them to use. I did not have to post an accumulation. So that's a wonderful um, feature of that new um, leaves option. The pay distributions option, I love this grid. Um, it's so much easier to look at. You don't have to click into um, the actual pay distribution, you know, a couple times um, in order to see the information that you want to see, it's all right here in front of you. So if I want to verify that new employee's information that I just entered, I can quickly, you know, search for them. And I can see then um, if I would have entered the account information routing number, I can see it all, it would be, it's listed on the grid. Will the new leaves option be available on the employee dashboard? Um, that's a good that's a good um, suggestion, Amy. I'll write that down. I'm not sure that we already have um, an issue for that, but that is a great suggestion. I think we I think it was brought up at our sprint meeting, um, so there might already be an issue out there. Um, but I'm making a note to that to check into it, and if there's not, I will. Um, add one. Thank you so much. That was, that's a great, great suggestion. Okay. So what will um, eventually be super nice is the ability to generate a report from this grid. So maybe you have um, a district that is, you know, banks are merging um, and information routing number needs change. So, you know, you can filter by that now. So that's wonderful. So you can see all the employees that it, um, effects 
Um, and then you could just mass load, you know, that information for um, those employees, but we don't have a way to extract it yet from this grid and that will be coming. So um, a wonderful new feature, you can quickly check information, look up information when it, it comes to their pay distribution, you know, all in, in one spot versus having to click into the record or, you know, bounce between multiple records and so forth. Okay. And then lastly um, is the pay accounts option. So this too um, is super helpful now because you can see for a specific employee, you know, what pay accounts do I have set up for them? Um, and again, eventually, you know, we'll have the reportability and it will be wonderful to be able to extract that information into something to maybe use it to load um, you know, back into the system and change or update or, or um, modify. So wonderful, wonderful additions. I just wanted to make sure that everybody was aware of those because um, I think the grids are wonderful. Um, you know, they're, I always say grids are our friends. So make them work for you, change columns around, move them, you know, um, all that good stuff um, so that it makes most sense to that specific user. Um, or you know, you yourself. Okay, great. I love love the comments. <laughs> we love that you love it. <laughs> All right. So that's adding a new employee. Um, you know, again, using a template or um, just manually, and a real brief rundown of what each of those screens you know entail and how they work, um, and so forth. My goodness, I see it's almost 10, 15 already. And I thought, my goodness, I'll be lucky if I go an hour. So I get long-winded and realize I need to speed up here. Okay, so that's option three. Um, option four and actually options five um, can kind of you know work hand in hand. So when we're talking about attendance information, um, there's multiple ways you can enter attendance. Um, you can enter it using the employee dashboard which is, I skipped over that option on purpose, you know, to come back and show you. You can add it using um, just going to core and using the attendance option. Or again, you can load that um, information um, using the app, attendance absence import option. Um, so those of you that are familiar with Classic, you know, it used to be USP import. I should point out um, while I'm thinking about it, we did in continue to include the classic name on this updated checklist um, just for the time being, you know, probably a year from now, we, you know, we'll be able to remove that and not even think about classic anymore. Um, those acronyms are a thing of the past and we'll struggle to remember them, right? Because we've not used them for a couple of years now, but we did um, leave them in the, the checklist just for, for, the time being, um, and then, so if you do need to, your districts need to, you know, reference, oh, I can't remember what that, what what I used in Classic, you know, we have that spelled out for you, for them. Um, so anyway, getting back to um, attendance, um, again, you know, absences sort of work the same way. You can enter the absences, um, you know, going to the actual core option, and entering it that way, or you can load the information um, using a, a load file. When you're entering attendance information um, and you're loading it, you can also load the payment side of things. So that's why I'm seeing these two um, sort of work, you know, steps four and five, I'm sorry, four and six sort of work um, hand in hand. So if you're entering attendance, um, at the same time, you can also be entering the payment side of things, whether you're using a load file or you're using um, the attendance option um, and using that link to um, future. And again, because we're working with everything before we've initialized, we're going to be focusing on future. Um, tomorrow, when Andrea goes through the payroll process, after you've hit that initialize new payroll option, then everything is going to be brought into current and then you'll be working strictly in current. But right now we're going to, you know, work outside the payroll process. We're going to get as much done as we can ahead of time 
So we're going to focus on future. Okay. So let's talk first about absences. So again, um, I can manually enter my absence information um, using, um, you know, the core option, or I can actually go to um, the to create a file and I can load my absence information that way. So a lot of districts now are working with third parties. So I don't know how often they're manually entering um, information into um, the attendance um, option. But um, if, if you have an exception or two, or you know they're not using a third party, um, you can simply go to the employee's dashboard and I can go to attendance and I can click create and I can enter then the information that way. So if I have um, absence information that's multiple, you know, this employee was gone for, you know, several days throughout my um, pay period, I can just continue um, copying the row and changing then maybe just the activity date. So, you know, he was gone and I apologize because I'm gonna go back and we're gonna use, so I don't mess things up for tomorrow. I'm gonna use 8-1 and he was absent a full day. And then I can just copy the row and all I need to do is change the date then. And if I would have copied the date along with it, I would really just need to change the day. Everything else would stay the same. So I can continue to copy the row and keep going. So this is just basically, you know, dealing with an ind individual employee, um, you know, adding the absence information for this one specific person. Um, when it comes to absences, obviously this um, posting option doesn't come into play. So, you know, there's nothing um, that we need to worry about there. So I'm going to click save. Oh, yeah, I didn't change the day here. Delete this and click save. Okay, so now that um, that absence information has been added for this employee in those two days, you can see that we added are here. The other way to add um, absences for one person is to use the mass add option. I love this feature. Um, I can you know, make sure that my um, transaction type is set correctly. Um, my category is correct. I can either use dates. So I can use enter a, a range of dates and then that will populate um, on the grid below um, the calendar. Let me, I'm just gonna choose current dates because that's the month we have up so that you can see how it works. And you can see that once I entered those dates here, it highlights those dates on the calendar below. I simply, if those are correct, I click create and this, it's telling me here seven records are gonna be created. Super, super easy, okay? I can also go down below and say that they're not in consecutive order. I can just click on those days that the employee was absent. And again, make sure that my category, my type, my length is correct. I click create and it's telling me four records are gonna be created. So all of that in a couple clicks, okay? Super, super easy. The other way to add attendance is to go to core attendance. And this to me would be if you're dealing with multiple, you districts has a user has a stack of absences and they're entering them by hand. Um, I'm not dealing with one specific person. So I'm not gonna go to that person's, you know, each individual per um, employee's dashboard per se. I'm gonna go to the grid and I'm gonna click create. Now, one thing I've learned, um, a little trick if you didn't know, is if we move this box up towards the top and I'm gonna take my stack of absences 
And I'm just going to keep entering, 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 entering as many as I can. Moving this box up to the top gives me the ability to add more rows before I run out of space. Okay. So I'm going to enter my first employee. And I'm going to, it's attendance. Okay. Now I'm done with that employee's absence information. I'm not going to copy the row. I'm going to click the plus sign. And now I'm going to add my next employee, the Easter Bunny. And I'm going to give him an app day of absence. He was absent again, so I can copy the row. And I simply need to just change the date. Once I'm done, then adding, you know, again, you can just, they can just keep going. Um, you know, for it until you either run out of room or you're done adding your absences. And I'm going to click save. All of those records that I just added are on the grid behind me. Okay. You can also use um, a, a load file. So districts probably use a third party like ASAP, um, those, those sorts of um, third parties. They're usually really good about um, setting up some sort of extract file that um, matches our file format. Excuse me, one more time. Um, and I have that pulled up here um, so that you can see, and I'm sure you're all familiar with this, um, but we do have the um, specific file specifications in the um, attendance absence import chapter. And keep in mind, unlike mass load, where um, it doesn't matter what order um, the information is in, it's mass load cares about the column headings. Um, the attendance absence import option does care about the placement of each column. They have to be in this specific order. So, you know, the record indicator of AA has to be in column one. The employee ID has to be in column two and so forth. So if you're working with a new district to set things up or they're working with a third party, um, you know, the, the, the column placement is, is critical. Um, so if something's not loading correctly, you know, make sure that you're going down the list and make sure everything's in the right place. So I have created an absence load file, and I did wanna show you here. Um, what's helpful to me, um, and again, this is just a personal preference, is I have like references to the column headings in row one so that I know exactly what needs to be placed in that specific column. So if to me, you know, if, if you're starting out with the true record in row one, I might get, you know, out of sorts when it comes, you know, to these later columns and not know where something might need to be. But if I have a description in row one, then I know that, oh, I want to add, you know, a pay account to this um, attendance record, this, this payment, um, that needs to be here. Um, again, not required, but that's just helpful for me to keep everything in the right place. Um, know that when you load the file, then you are going to get an error um, every time saying that this, you know, is not a loadable record, which is fine. If it's only one, and I know it's row one, um, which we'll see here in a minute, everything's good. Okay, so I have my file again. Third parties are great with set, getting this set up for districts. And by now, you know, they've worked with enough. If it's not a new third party, they've worked with state software districts, you know, for years now. So they should have something in place. Um, you're going to save the file in CSV format. And then we're going to go to back to our instance here. We're going to go to the attendance absence import option. I'm going to browse to find the file. I called the file absence load. 
Um, I'm not going to select a location code. This is like building that you're in. Um, it can be um, the building and department. So if I have that specified in my um, file, I can choose that if I'd like. Whoops. Oh, shoot. Sorry about that. The um, post to payroll options don't apply to our absence file. So we're going to leave that as none. Um, do we want to combine the attendance entries, um, uh, entries and do we want to allow negative leave balances? If those apply um, to, to the user, the district, the way they want to see things or the way that their negotiated agreement is set up, then they check those boxes or not check them. And then because this isn't any kind of payment that we're dealing with, we don't need to worry about the pay account. I'm going to click import. And one thing that's nice is, oh yeah, I did this on purpose, sorry. Um, you know, we have this screen down here now that shows um, the errors right on the screen along with the ATT ERR error file. So you're gonna see those, you know, listed right on your screen. And I purposely um, left the file with some errors to see first that, you know, that row Number one, we're always going to get an error on because that's not um, formatted correctly. Um, and then you can see other types of errors that districts might get, um, like the absence can't be more than one day. So this employee already has an absence 481. Um, so, and it was already, you know, this record would exceed the total um, of one day. So it errors out. So if by chance, we made a mistake on our file, and that should have been maybe for a different day. Um, we can simply open up that error file. And you can see here that it tells us, you know, what the actual error, again, what that error is. We can actually make the changes right in this error file and correct what might be wrong. So let's just put a different day in these. Okay, so now I have my updated file. I'm gonna save this again. And let's go save it in the same place. And I'm just gonna, let's call this absent corrected. It's in CSV format. I can save that. I'm going to go back to the attendance absence import option. I'm going to choose that corrected file. Everything else should be good. And I'm going to click import. And my session time. Up. Let's see what happened here. I think my session timed out in the middle. I apologize. I'm going to try to cancel this just to see where I'm not sure if it went through or not yet. Uh -oh. Okay. For, for uh, time purposes, since it is already 1030, I, I think you get, get the gist um, that, you know, you can make the changes to whatever, um, you know, the errors might be. Oh, I can see that I did. My dates aren't formatted correctly. To the ATT ERR file, and then save that again in CSV, and you should be able just to load that without any issues. So... I apologize. I think something got mixed up when my system uh, disconnected there for a hot second. Okay. All right. Love this too. You can see the errors right on the screen. So that's a, a wonderful new addition. Um, so along with the ATT ERR file, you can see those errors um, right on on the you know after it loads. So that's a great great new new thing. 
Okay, so now that's absences. Uh, when it comes to um, adding um, attendance information, you can basically um, handle that the same way. So we're going to add another piece then to that, um, you know, by adding the payment side of things. So we can add the attendance information and we can link that if there's a payment involved to future um, if we desire. So if we want to just add attendance information, again, it's, you know, going to core. If we're dealing with multiple records at a time, um, I would use the, the attendance um, option under core. And again, I can click create to bring this all the way up to the top, start entering all my attendance information for either one person or multiple people. And then, you know, this is slightly different and I can just show you quick here. I feel bad we're running out of time. So now we've changed this type to be attendance. And then in this case, the category is attendance. Um, I can also add a pay date and the substitute for um, if this person is subbing for a regular employee, if I'd like. But here's where I can link the pay, link this to paying the employee. So if this is a substitute and they're subbing, I can change this posting mode to post future. I can click save. And that's going to then bring me to another window and allow me then to post this record to future. Oops. I must not have a rate on the actual compensation, which is my bad, because otherwise it would pull from that. Okay, so now if I go to future, so if I go to payroll, payroll payments future, I should be able to see that one record that we just included um, when we added our attendance, we included the payment side of things. Awesome, I love all the positive comments. Okay, so that's one way to add attendance and then also include the payment. Um, again, you know, not every attendance record has a payment attached to it. So, you know, if you're not using, you don't need to pay them, then you're not going to change that posting mode when you go to create the attendance record or records. Um, again, just like absences, you can mass add attendance. So if I select my employee, I can select, you know, select the position. I make sure that this is switched to attendance, which then um, you know changes the category. Um, if I need to include a, a subcategory, I can. I, I miss saying that on the absences, but hopefully you guys all know that that's there. Um, if you know they're not reporting to both retirement systems, I do not have to select an appointment type. Um, it'll default to the the proper um, system. If I need to add, you know, if this is a substitute and I want to add who this employee is subbing for, I can. Um, and then you can either end, you know, enter your start and end dates here, um, which will populate those values down here, or I can simply click the boxes and then click create, and that will create my records. Now, if I'm also wanting to include the payment side of things here, I want to change this posting mode to post future. Click create. Okay. And we've three, one. Okay. I've added so many records, I'm not sure what I. Let's try that. Nope. All right, we might have to select some down here. <laughs> Let's try dates down below. We'll get there. 
There we go. Sorry about that. I can't remember what all I what dates I've used and added for what. Um, so again, this screen looks um, very similar to what we saw before. Um, we have the ability, you know, to change the pay type if we like, um, add a description, um, enter the rate, which, you know, if that's only if that's different from what the compens is entered on the compensation. If we had something there, which I failed to enter, it would um, populate here. Um, and then we can click post to future. And we can see here that it says, we get a message that says the record has been posted to future. And if I close this and we go back to payroll, payroll payments future, you can see that additional record that we just added um, through the mass add option is added as well. Lastly, then um, we're going to talk about adding um, rec attendance and posting information to future using a load file. So, you know, again, we talked about the importance of, you know, everything being in the proper column, um, not doesn't matter about, you know, column headings. Um, when you use attendance absence import, um, column headings aren't important, it's the placement of the data. So again, I've already set up um, a file for us to use today. I'm gonna to go to the absence, attendance absence import option. I'm gonna to browse to find my file, which I've called attendance load. Um, and then I'm going to also change this post to payroll processing options to post to future. You can check these boxes if you know, the, uh, well, we're doing, um, the leave balances won't matter because we're posting attendance, but if you want to combine um, multiple days um, into one entry, you can check the box. And I'm going to click import. Okay. And I, I did, you know, want you to see an error and how those pop up on the screen um, now. So, you know, i there is a, uh, an employee in the file that I purposely, you know, changed the ID so that you could see how those errors would be displayed. Okay, so now again, because we have um, posted that information to future, the information that was in our file, you should see also included in future. Okay, so that's, um, That's using um, the load file option. Okay. And I'm sorry, I'm like bad about checking the chat. Okay, I, I, I will make note of that as well and um, I will pass that along or look into, you know, if there's an ins the uh, issue already created. Perfect. Makes sense. Okay. I'm sorry if I, if I'm, I'm not trying to ignore any of you, um, just interrupt me if I'm, if there's something that, you know, you want to bring to my attention right away. Okay, um, so the last thing, and I know we're running way past time here, um, is you know if the district doesn't use any kind of load file, um, we talked about using attendance and that link to future, but what if they just want to add information into future? So um, to do that, they would go to payroll, payroll payments future, and then we're gonna click create, okay? So we have um, information that we need to, need to add for our Easter Bunny. Um, I can put in a description if I'd like. Um, remember, you can now use quotes. So um, we have the ability for your load file to accept quotes. So if you want a description to say a range of you know, days, um, so like eight, one comma eight, um, 15, I wanted, I forgot to mention that in the load file, you can now add, include that with 
um, a set of quotes and the system will accept it. Okay, so we'll just click test here and we're gonna enter, this is for a miscellaneous payment. The effective date, if we want to pull this in, the next payroll, um, the employees being paid, then we don't want to enter an effective date. Um, some districts like to enter maybe supplemental payments that are paid three times um, throughout the school year, the first of you know three months throughout the season. Um, so again, you can control when those payments are pulled into um, the payroll by using the effective date. But if you want it pulled in the next payroll they're paid, we want to leave that blank. So we're going to pay this employee one unit. And again, my bad. Um, actually, let's use a different example. This might be better. So it should pull the, the payroll, the rate, right from the actual um, compensation record. So but this is a better example. It pulled the rate right from the, the compensation record itself um, from the unit field. Um, if this is different, it can be changed. Um, but in this case, we're going to say it's correct. I did want to talk a little bit about um, pay accounts. Um, we added this wonderful feature here um, to the pay account section so that if I um, click on the down arrow, any um, pay account that has been charged in the past um, will be displayed um, when uh, you know I use the drop down arrow. If there's if this is a new account for this employee um, for this position and it has not been charged yet, and I want to charge it to something else, I can click um, the search icon, and this then brings a listing of all of the 100 object codes. So I can easily start adding the part of the account that I do know, and it's going to hopefully find, let's see here. Okay, it'll start um, narrowing down then based on the criteria that I entered those accounts. If I want to see all expenditure accounts, whether it be a 100 object code or not, I click on the include all accounts. And if I filter this by object code starting with two, you can see it lists all of those as well. If I uncheck this box, let me start typing a two. It's not finding any, okay? So, you know, we, we had requests over and over to have this pay accounts feature work most like Classic did. Um, so it really is a, a wonderful improvement um, and hopefully, you know, districts will find it helpful as well. So again, the drop down is only gonna show you pay accounts that have been charged in the past. Um, if you want to create a new account for this, you can you can do that. So you would, I guess I didn't show that part. I can highlight this new account and I'm gonna click select account. And it's just gonna say, are you sure you wanna add this account? I'm gonna say yes. Once I save this account then, or save this record, I'm sorry, that account then is um, saved for this employee's, under this employee's accounts to be used over and over again. Okay, anytime you see these create new options, um, if you're adding multiple records, um, you know, click the create new option and this allows you to keep going. So just kind of like the copy row option in attendance, um, this allows you to enter your next record and then just keep going. So even if this is another employee, you know, obviously we're gonna have to clear out the name and I can click bunny and all his information is gonna start populating, but I can just keep going. So instead of saving, Xing out, clicking create, starting over again, you know, repeating the process, that's a huge time saver. Click that create new option and it'll just keep you in that ad mode and, and keep you going. All right, so once we have everything entered in future, um, 
and we've added all of our absence and attendance information, then we probably want to balance that, right? So um, those are listed on the checklist under step five and then um, step seven. So we want to balance our attendance and absence information as well as our future information. So those reports then um, are on the home page. So if I click to home, we have the SSDT attendance journal report and we have the SSDT future pay amount report. So for ease of time, I'm not gonna go through each of those. You guys have probably, you've probably seen them, um, but just know that you know once everything's entered, we wanna double and triple check everything before um, you know, we go any further. And then, like I said, once we have all the, that pre-payroll stuff checked, triple checked, um, when we pick up tomorrow, when Andrea starts tomorrow in the actual payroll process, we're, we've you know, done all of that preliminary balancing. We're gonna start with step eight and it should just be, you know, I know it sounds easier than it actually is, but in reality, we should be able to initialize the payroll. You know, hopefully there aren't any last minute exceptions um, to be added, but we're just gonna go through a couple other checks and then we're gonna click post payroll and we're, we're, we're done, okay? With the actual payroll processing part. All right, that is all I have this morning. I apologize that we went even beyond the time that we said we would. Um, are there any questions before we um, end today's session? I did make note of those couple um, enhancement requests, and I will, you know, certainly look into those and add Jira issues um, for those if they don't already exist. But I much appreciate your feedback. It's it's um, wonderful. All right. Okay. That's all I have today. Um, again, we'll regroup tomorrow at the same time. Um, you won't have to hear me again. You'll get to hear Andrea. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful day, and um, we'll talk to you all soon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.